this movie is widely touted as one of the, quote, worst movies ever. Right up there with Halle Berry's Catwoman. But whenever a large studio movie is referred to as one of the worst movies ever, Travis and I immediately kind of throw up a red flag because we're like, look, there are countless, limitless, an infinity of worse movies than any studio movie that's ever been made. An opinion like The Avengers is the worst movie ever made is a boring opinion for boring people. Greetings, loyal listeners and new recruits. I'm Drew Deitch. I'm Travis Newton. And this is Genre Vision. Genre Vision is a weekly movie club where we discuss horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci fi cinema, and more. And we are continuing March Madness, an entire month of mad scientist movies, with The Avengers from 1998. Yes, The Avengers were not always just a collective of. Uh, Disney mascots. They were actually a, from what I understand, an extremely popular British mod spy series. Going into this movie, I had basically zero familiarity with the source material. I've never seen an episode of the show. I didn't, I hadn't even seen footage from the show until after we had watched the movie. I primarily knew about the Avengers property from this movie that came out in 1998. And the fact that I knew Diana Rigg was in the original show. Yeah, I'm working from pretty much the same knowledge base here. The Avengers property was not at all popular in the United States when you and I were growing up. It like wasn't syndicated anywhere that you and I watched. Uh, it wasn't you know highly available for you and I to you know have seeping into our young minds. And so I didn't really feel any sort of sense of obligation to watch this movie having researched what the original show really was. Because if the movie's good enough, it should work well enough on its own to introduce these characters, these classic characters or cult classic characters, to a new generation, right? If the movie's working well enough, it should do that. And so we're really just here to evaluate the movie as a standalone thing, if it stands alone at all. You know, obviously, I accepted that there was an inevitability here. It's like, oh, well, this might actually suck really hard. It, it can certainly still be bad. That's not something that we were negating out of the, the possibility of our experience with it. But when you say a movie like The Avengers 1998 is one of the worst movies ever, immediately, I think our curiosity radar starts going into overdrive. So we're like, well, what what are people actually talking about here? Right. And when we started this movie, it became very apparent very early on why I think a lot of this movie was not only poorly received, but was never going to be well received on any level by an American audience or frankly, any popular mainstream audience. It would seem to me that this particular IP didn't have a lot of cachet with Americans. And so that makes me really curious as to why it was adapted into a big American blockbuster at all. I can tell you the reasons for that. Well, I mean, obviously there were financial motivations for it. So, well, it, it was, it's also that this was a, the nineties are a very interesting time for adaptation because now so much of what gets adapted into things and, and rebooted and remade are pre-existing film properties and pre-existing uh, IPs from other media like comic books. But in the 90s, there was this huge wave of readapting cult television shows into feature film blockbusters. Sure, Mission Impossible had done well, you know. Mission Impossible, The Saint, uh, there, there was, um, The Phantom wasn't necessarily a TV show, but, you know, serials, you know, The Shadow, all this kind of stuff. This was a big boom period for it. So it was really like what it just becomes like, what do we have the rights to? What hasn't been made? What can we do with it? And from what I understand, the Avengers, you know, maintained a very strong popular cult following in the UK. Again, it gave the world Diana Rigg, which it should always be recognized for, you know, giving us the gift that was Diana Rigg. But it was very clear that the Avengers was an inescapably British property. And this movie leans into that in such a strong way that I'm I'm shocked that studios ever even entertain the notion that Americans would be interested in it. Well, here's the thing. The Bond movies and, of course, the Austin Powers movies leaned into their Britishness as a camp element that 
Americans found enjoyable regardless. They were able to look at this and see a sense of nationalistic pride that made sense to them, whereas in the Avengers, there is an appreciation of some things in British culture I think Americans wouldn't really get uh, or at least not have the kind of connections to that um, they might in a, in a Bond film or even in you know the, the lampooning of them in Austin Powers. Um, because Austin Powers can drive a car that looks like, you know, the, the British flag and it's like, okay, yeah, um, that's cool. We know that's cool. It's not my flag, but damn, that looks cool. (laughs) That's not my flag, baby. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, James Bond can ski off a mountain and then fall off a cliff and pull his big British parachute, you know, and Americans will cheer because it's played as this really incredible moment. But Avengers looks at this really odd a sense of like how British science fiction stories were told. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons why Dr. Who doesn't really, you know, even though Dr. Who does have a sizable American audience, it still feels much more sort of deep cut British because it's a particular kind of British television and certainly wouldn't adapt well to like a Hollywood adaptation. Well, it, it was for so long. It's only in very recent reboots of, of the property that they even tried to really grasp an American audience. And what's interesting about the Avengers as a movie is that this leans into its Britishness in such an aggressive way that it does not feel like it was made for anybody but the British in mind. Yeah. In a way I admire it because it's clearly adapting the source material as a sense of pride in what it believes is great about British science fiction, action, thriller fiction. Right. And it has some really odd approaches to doing stuff like this. Like it doesn't do the kind of typical introduction to going to Britain montage. Like you see in so many American movies, somebody was, I forget who it was making fun of the conjuring Two. It might've been Patrick Williams actually, where he's making fun of the sequence where we cut to London and conjuring Two, And of course you hear the clash London calling. And of course it's the fast cut montage of like recognizable London landmarks. Here's a, here's a double decker bus, you know, here's big Ben fucking spice world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, you know that that kind of shit has been done or you don't see buckingham palace in here you know it's not doing those kind of standard beats it's got nothing to do with the fucking queen (laughs) it has much stranger approaches to this for instance ray finds his character john steed he drives a car that has a tea dispenser in the dashboard like it's patrick stewart's fucking enterprise tea dispenser (laughs) it's crazy well they will drink tea like stereotypically british you know with their you know very daintily while they're driving and and doling out exposition like if that's a barrier for you that the aggressive Brit- and and to be fair to give some context of the time this came out post austin powers and i think austin powers killed this movie it was dead on arrival because austin powers was spoofing so much of that that when this movie tried to do it with a genuine i feel earnest love of this goofiness audiences were like, we just watched an entire movie that made fun of all this. Right. Yeah. Audiences would not have been prepared for this movie's approach to camp. So I think it was absolutely DOA in the same way that like Austin Powers had the cultural, even though Austin Powers was a flop first at theaters, it gained so much momentum on home video that it fucking murdered the bomb franchise temporarily. Sure. So it's really astonishing. So, um, yeah, I can absolutely see why this movie would not have done well with critics or audiences in the U.S. And subsequently, the studio was like, well, we're not going to screen this for critics. It was Warner Brothers. We're not going to screen it for critics, which, of course, all the critics went, ooh, I smell a flop. And, of course, all the, you know, they got all very bloodthirsty. And, you know, um, the critics will certainly be, I, having been a person who reviewed movies on a professional level for some time in my life, critics absolutely sharpened their fangs when a movie was not available for um for or not going to be screened for critics oh i mean i i can i can tell you anecdotally when i was doing this professionally i went and saw a critic screening of the snowman and the earliest critic screening was the thursday night before release when you would do like a typical you know all right this movie's going to release at 7 p.m it was at 7 p.m Right. And it's basically the studio doing damage control. Yes, exactly. Like limiting the time between, you know, when the movie comes out and what, you know, when the critic 
reviews and everything come out. So I, I've been in an audience where we all knew, like, we know, we know what we're in for. So the Avengers was already, I think, like we said, doomed at the start. Now, reappraising it and watching it. I mean, because this is the thing. This is, I, I had seen this movie before, but it was so long ago and under such kind of I was not paying attention to circumstances. This was essentially a first watch. And this movie, I commend it so much for a big thing that we talk about on this show. And that is that no matter what criticism you have, and trust me, we have criticisms of this movie. The Avengers is a movie with a vision. Yeah, it's pretty clear that the director, Jeremiah Chechik, who's like no visionary, he had done the um, the remake of Diabolique, which uh, you know, kind of odd, not a particularly well-reviewed movie, but evidently Warner Brothers like working with him on it. They liked working with him and, you know, they felt that there was, you know, a potential to make a hit. And Jeremiah Chechik went away and made this movie, he directed this movie, and um, his final cut um, that he submitted to Warner Brothers was nearly two hours long. Uh, studio didn't like it. It tested very, very poorly, um, which is probably not a surprise. And then Warner brothers forced him to cut it down to the current running time, which is about an hour and a half. And so not only are any potential like character beats missing, there are sections of this where the plot is so thinly strung together that the movie doesn't make a ton of sense. It's not like the plot's really, really complicated or mega, mega twisty, There are just sections of the film that suddenly feel like dream sequences. For instance, you know, there is a section where after we meet our two leads, uh, John Steed and Emma Peel, played by Ray Fiennes and Uma Thurman, they split up to investigate this mystery. Uma Thurman goes to the mansion of uh, the villain, uh, August de Winter, played by Sean Connery, Sir Sean Connery. And then while that's going on, and we can obviously uh, circle back to that scene, but Ray finds his character suddenly we, we cut to him in like the middle of a wooded field with trees. It's like, what's going on here? It is established that they're both on the grounds of Sir August de Winter's property, but that Ray finds is like inspecting the grounds while uh, Uma Thurman's character, Emma Peel is going into the mansion to meet with Sean Connery. But this is a great example. Like when you say the movie isn't very complicated, It's actually as in its current form, it does, quote, make sense because anything to do with the plot has remained in the movie and stayed there. Mm -hmm. But it is everything supplemental to that that has been excised for time, which is strengthening motivations and dynamics between characters. You know, stuff like that has all fallen by the wayside. And that's why where Travis was like, is this a dream sequence? Because we are cutting from two characters having a conversation that's clearly taking place in in reality to Ray Fiennes walking in a wooded field where there's a single red telephone booth. It's, It's a surreal image. Yeah, and a decidedly surreal image. It's like the movie was really leaning into the surrealism of it. And, you know, there's like sort of a soft, I don't know, maybe like a a soft filter over the lens. So like the the highlights are really blooming and it's kind of like dreamy and floaty. And Ray finds his character walks through the frame kind of dreamily towards this red phone booth and he gets in and he starts having a conversation. And it's like, this really does feel like a a dream is happening. And then suddenly a strong tornado gust kind of blows in and it's like, what is, what is happening here? This is so leaning into the surrealism of it. And then after this big gust blows through, He's suddenly in like a winter wonderland, like the entire landscape around him has become this wintry like Narnia. Then Uma Thurman comes out of the woods on a sleigh pulled by dogs and she shoots him. And then he wakes up in a completely different location. So it's like this is very, very much leaning into the whole dreaminess of it without question my cursory examination of the property after we watched the movie, there does seem to be an acknowledgement of a certain, it's so specific to the sixties, this idea of dreamy. I can't necessarily call it psychedelia, but it is this like adapting a surreal visual style 
in terms of the environment and and things like that into a concrete reality. Like for for example, the one one of the only things that I remembered from this movie is that Sir Augusta Winter, played by Sean Connery, has a, a meeting of all the people that are involved in his scheme. He's the mad scientist, and he's going to take control of this weather system that can control the weather across the world. And he has this meeting of all the people involved in this evil plot, and everybody is dressed up in giant, multicolored teddy bear costumes. Including Sean Connery. Thank you. It is an absolutely wackadoo image. And what was great when we were screening it, I was like, yeah, you know, like this isn't a dream. Like it's certainly, you know, vibing with this whole particular art style of the 60s. And then we immediately cut to a bunch of people in teddy bear outfits. And Travis is like, you're going to tell me this isn't dreamlike. Like this is so surreal. And the thing is that I'm again kind of in awe of the movie committing to that because it was clearly, I mean, even, you know, Travis experienced it when we were watching it. It was going to throw up a wall of confusion around viewers who it absolutely screwed with their sense of reality. Yeah, I think there was sort of an uh, a big question. It's like, will you go with it? Ask to audiences here. And I don't think American audiences would go with this. There's just something about it that seems antithetical to what Americans want out of these kinds of movies. It's just too weird. It's It's just not... It's not what they're looking for, but I admire that it's committing to a vision that really works in the film's favor now. Like in in retrospect, I think this is one of the stronger aspects of the movie is like the movie has ideas of what it's going for. And in execution, I think it's doing interesting things, but I just don't think there's an audience for that necessarily there or there there wasn't an audience for it in 1998. I think the movie earns it in an introductory scene when we first meet John Steed. He is this stereotypically looking British man with his, you know, jacket and and little bowler hat and and walking down a very picturesque lane of houses and everything. And he's walking with his umbrella. And all of a sudden, every single person that he comes across is trying to kill him and he's defending against himself. And it's it's presented as like, what's going on here? It actually looks like a movie musical. That's like a welcome to our world sequence, you know, where it's choreographed. It's like a dance. Yeah. And he's whipping, you know, like the milkman throws throwing daggers at him and, you know, uh, an old woman with a pushing, pushing a pram, you know, tries to kill him and all this stuff. And it it's a super wackadoo moment only to be revealed that he's walking through a prefabricated set. And this is a training exercise with the ministry, which is the secret agency that he's an agent of. And that is, I feel like such a mission statement of the movie. Like we're going to set you in this fantastical world where any ridiculous thing we want can and will happen, but we're acknowledging the ridiculousness of it. There is that. And again, I think that is not necessarily a bad thing, but the way this movie is constructed, there is no audience proxy character at any point in the movie. Yes. And so when you're letting audiences into a property they may not be familiar with, I think it's important to include a character who isn't really in on what is happening in the plot so that there is a way to explain what the movie is about and like what the certain roles are and you know what is the ministry and what does it do because as the movie exists now there really is no opportunity or reason to explain any of those things because all the characters already know it just feels like another episode of the tv show done with more money to commit to the the action and the effect sequences. Yes. Like that's kind of what I feel like they were going for is to capture the sort of signature surrealist elements of the show and the uh, clear, you know, sexual dynamic between John Steed and Emma Peel. That was clearly like part of the show's substance and something that a lot of people liked about the show is their banter full of double entendres yet never being able to consummate, you know, their clear attraction to each other. It's, you know, I think trying to capture so many things that clearly the creatives involved loved about the show, that certainly is not a good plan to resonate with wide audiences, however. No, but I will say, I I think one of the best things about the movie is actually the casting. I think Ray Fiennes is almost perfectly cast. I think he's really jiving with what the movie's trying to do. 
it's a very one note performance. And in all honesty, that's across the board. Now, that's not always a bad thing. No, I think these these characters are very crystal cut and kind of cartoonish. But I agree. Ray Fiennes is doing good work. He He's extremely enjoyable. He is meeting the movie on its wavelength and honestly delivering a lot of good line. You know, like the lines that he's getting, he's delivering well. Uma Thurman, when we were watching it, you said that you felt she was miscast. I don't think she was miscast on her own. I think she's miscast next to what Ray Fiennes is doing. He has a much better grasp on the material than she does. And because they are almost always paired together on screen, it diminishes her performance. Agreed. Now they have chemistry. You know, that's something that I think the movie needed. So, and there, I think the movie spends a decent amount of time building up the idea that sexual tension exists between these two characters, which is important because that's one of the things that defines their dynamic. But, you know, I, I hate to say it. I love Uma Thurman. I think she's a wonderful actor. Her accent in this movie is not quite up to snuff when she's acting against Rafe Fiennes, Jim Broadbent, Sean Connery, Fiona Shaw, you know, these incredible English performers and Scottish performers. It's like, yeah, these people are at the like the top of their game. They're all like Shakespearean performers who have been acting in the UK for fucking decades. And you have Uma Thurman, who is like a wonderful, wonderful performer, but is kind of a fish out of water. I won't disagree with that, but I don't think she's I don't think she's bad in the movie, but she's like I'm saying, I think the the caliber of what she's up against just was not fair. Can you imagine Gillian Anderson in this role? I mean, I think that would have been a way better pairing. I wouldn't have said no to it. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have kicked that movie out of bed for eating crackers. Then there's Sean Connery, our our mad scientist in March Madness month, August de winter, which I'm somebody who loves that. I love that the weather obsessed super scientist villain is called August de winter. And he is introduced with an image of this pedestal shot going up of two tables filled to the brim with snow globes. Interesting shot, you know, really good set dressing. He basically lives in this giant manse. It almost looks like it was shot in a cathedral. He's introduced playing an organ ridiculously. It, it It's pure comic book supervillain. And that's something I love. Like, I actually miss that in these kinds of movies where it's like, yeah, just lean into the obviousness and the over the topness of the theming of your villain. Yeah, it's great. And then when we get the first dialogue scene between him and Uma Thurman, it is very clear to me that Sean Connery is relishing getting to play what is this is essentially James Bond given the opportunity to play the most over the top Bond villain possible. Yeah, um, he seems to be having fun and he was an excellent performer. Can't say a whole lot about him as a human being, but he was an excellent performer, a clear movie star. So him being able to do this and do it, you know, in a way that made him look like, ah, oh, this is exactly what I wanted to get out of this. It reminded me of seeing him in Highlander where it's like, yes, I know this is silly, but I'm having a fucking ball doing it. Yes. And so the, the performance is fun to watch as a result. It's a one note performance, but it's a beautiful note. But everybody is. That's the thing is like, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with you having a one note performance, if that's the 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 dictum of the land, basically, where it's like, this is what we're going. Like the movie is going for that. That's a goal of it, uh, of it. And, and I don't think that's necessarily intrinsically a bad thing if your movie as a whole supports that interpretation. Yeah, um, I think the characters suffer a little bit, um, at least in terms of like Hollywood film aspects. Uh, expectation like there there's really no humanizing element to any of these characters because um you know steed and peel they are kind of inhumanly cool-headed you know they're always cool and competent and able to do things with a stiff upper lip like no matter the circumstance and i understand that there's like power in that it's aspirational it's what we might call competency porn people love watching james bond do things and do them well people like christopher nolan movies exactly but you know the characters are never really allowed to fuck up in this movie um they're never really characters to make big mistakes and and really reveal a human core and perhaps things like that you know a little bit more subtlety and complexity perhaps those were present in the longer cut i would like to hope they are because i think 
John Steed, like the version of the character that we see here, there is an element of like loneliness to him and kind of reserved sadness at times that I would love to see expanded upon. I was, you know, with, with, um, Peel, I was reminded almost a little bit of, uh, of Uma Thurman's, uh, role in the producer's movie. It's just, it, it was a kind of a camp thing that I think she did as well as she could. And I, I commend her for that, but, um, you know, there's, there's just not quite enough in terms of like the humanity of the characters for me to, to ever really care about them. Um, so it's more, it's just a movie about the scenarios that are happening instead of like what the characters are thinking and feeling. I agree. And that would be my biggest overarching criticism of the movie is that these aren't characters, they're cartoons. And I like cartoons. Like I, I like cartoons are great. I like plenty of cartoons as, and, and, you know, people will say, I'm saying that, uh, you know, dismissively, I'm not like, I can enjoy a very simplistic Saturday morning cartoon setup and watch it for 22 minutes and be fully satisfied. And and that's certainly the case. And I'm going to talk about when I get to my shelf pick with with feature films, too. If there is stuff around the rest of the movie that bolsters that, because there's other things about the Avengers that we very much enjoyed, but also that are just extremely weird decisions. One of the weirdest. And it's one that I, I, I don't even know how I'm reckoning with it. There are no extras in this movie. Almost never. There are a couple of scenes that have extras, uh, like the scene with all the people in the teddy bear costumes. Well, I mean, when we say extras, there are no crowds. There is no sense that London as a place is inhabited by people. Yeah, whenever people are walking around the streets, just like in real London, there are no extras. There are no crowds. There's shots of them driving, you know, whenever they're going to their secret ministry. There's no other cars on the road. Nothing. It's it's bizarrely barren to the point that I'm like, this had to be an artistic choice. It's kind of hauntingly empty in a lot of ways. It's very strange. And it's one of the things I think that people wouldn't necessarily notice on a first viewing. But, you know, if somebody mentioned it to you, you're going to be like, yeah, that's weird. Because the central conflict, you know, with the villain is like, okay, this is a guy that basically runs his own disaster movie. Like he can change the weather whenever he wants to, uh, and he can wreak havoc upon Britain and cause like disaster movie scenarios, but there are no people that seem to be affected by it. Hmm. And that's very anti-disaster movie. Instead, like the way that they set up this central premise of De Winter being able to control the weather is Evidently, in this world, this like alternate science fiction reality that it takes place in, De Winter has created a retail market for weather. So if you wanted to have a snowy day at home, you can buy it from him at a retail location. So there's this really bizarre scene, again, incredibly dreamlike, almost Twin Peaksy, where Steed and Peel walk into this shop with these really starkly kind of chunky black and white designs on the walls and um they sit down with this clerk who you know kind of dreamily tells them that they can buy certain weather conditions if they want to and so now that de winter has control of the weather his idea is to sell the weather to the british government so that the british government can have the weather they want eventually to the governments of the world he he storms into a big you know meeting because he's been uh generating these horrible you know bizarre weather anomalies across across the globe and, and in Britain and everything. And there's this big meeting of all the nations uh, of the government. The only crowd scene. The only crowd scene. The only crowd scene in the movie. And he walks in in this awesome, his kilt get up. It's so cool. And, and you know, starts hamming it up, talking about like, I control, you know, he's got his, the top of his cane as a globe with a lightning bolt struck through it. It's like, I adore how just straight up cartoon this is. And he says, like, you know, you're going to buy your weather from me and you'll pay top dollar for it. That's basically it. it's like, OK, stop this mad guy from controlling the weather. But because there are no crowd scenes when he eventually does, you know, blanket all of England in snow, it's like it's just buildings. It's happening. And granted, great miniature work, great model work. Yeah, I love the the miniatures of the London streets with the big snow banks and the buses blowing, the double decker buses blowing around. Like it looks good, you know, it looks good, but it's like I don't feel like anyone's ever in danger. Uh, the only thing that feels remotely dangerous in the movie, as far as conflict goes, is the uh, final big battle, which takes place in an incredible series of sets. Um, there's this big 
central column that the the big final fights take place in. It's just like, oh my god, this rocks. Yeah, no, I mean th- that's all good. The, there's so much in this movie that we're not going to be able to cover in the time because there is just a lot of weirdness in this. For example, there is an old woman who's also a ministry agent who shows up in the middle of uh, at the end of an action scene after uh, Eddie Izzard has released a giant horde of robo wasps to attack. <laughs> yeah. Eddie Izzard plays a silent hench person in the film. And um, I-, I love that, you know, more excuses to see Eddie Izzard. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, again, releasing giant robo wasps with machine guns that attack. Like I, I love that in concept. It look, it looks 1998 digital effects. Like you can't avoid that, but it's, it's not terrible. But then an old woman shows up in the middle of the road and pulls a Tommy gun out of nowhere and starts gunning bad guys down. And it's delightful. She's so awesome. (laughs) It's very hot fuzz. Um, and she has some very funny lines. She's actually probably the funniest character in the movie. Um, she has some really, really good jokes. Yeah. Uh, and luckily she keeps coming back. It's like, oh, thank God. Uh, loved that. And then there is the really bizarre choice in this film where people keep fainting or getting knocked out and waking up. It seems to be like a running gag. If it is a gag, it's not funny. Or if it's a running motif, I don't understand why. Well, it's it's also Maybe the moments. Maybe it's the whole dreamy aspect of the film. I don't know. I, I, I think that contributes to it. It's also the moments where we feel like we miss something because almost every time that happens, the movie will do a crossfade to another scene. And it's like, that was not in the original edit. It it If it was, it is a weird decision, but it feels, it was the moments where I felt like, oh yeah, that extra 30 minutes of movie we're missing, it was somewhere in there. Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems to be like that. You know, evidently reshoots were a part of um, the recutting of this film. And, you know, I understand they they did some pretty major surgery on this film to get it to work at the running time that they wanted it at. And, you know, it's the classic Hollywood studio thing of like, well, this movie didn't test well, so we're going to hack it to the shortest running time we can to make sure that people aren't bored. Uh, in doing so, they forget to make a good movie, but they made a short one. They did. I mean, it, you know, it's 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 in and out. And here's the thing is that I, I mostly enjoyed my time with the Avengers. Granted, it's, you know, whenever Travis and I watch these movies together, it's always better than when we watch them alone. But I will say that this movie never boring. Now, that is a symptom of the decision to hack it to pieces. And it's not always, you know a good thing that a movie is not taking time to breathe. This movie never, I won't say never. It takes one or two scenes to breathe. It's primarily scenes between uh, John Steed and Emma Peel to reinforce their kind of sexual tension. Yeah. There is a very, very fetish heavy scene between the two of them almost entering the third act of the film where uh, John Steed is putting Emma Peel's boots on. And it's like, Oh, this is just the director demonstrating their fetishes for the audience but you know it's an effective way to establish a sexual dynamic between the two characters it's sexy it's a sexy scene yeah it's it's definitely fetishistic at the very least but um again not ineffective i i think you know obviously the boredom thing is highly subjective but i can see why audiences might feel bored because this is so disconnected from any sort of reality or tone that audiences would have been excited about at the time you know think think about men in black for instance men in black is like one of the more perfect movies i think we've reviewed on this show where it is the same kind of basic structure you know where you have sort of a newcomer into this this world this sort of secret organization that has a purpose and through the structure of the movie we know that okay the roles here are clearly defined there is a character dynamic that is like crystal cut and immediately apparent Uh, The organization has a distinct purpose. We understand the reason for that purpose. The movie is incessantly funny. It is incredibly stylish and it is never in any instance boring, but it also never feels like it's jamming the movie down your throat and cutting the scenes to the bare minimum. That is a movie that knows exactly what it is doing and is so perfectly polished uh, and yet full of kind of interesting rough nooks and crannies to look into. Whereas the Avengers it's slick and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's weird. I like the weirdness of it. I like that there is a vision like men in black, but I can't help but like constantly sort of feel on the outside with these characters. I never really felt like they were in danger. I never understood why I should feel, you know, concerned about them or even really like them all that much. Um, it's, uh, 
it's difficult to get into. I can understand why people would feel bored. Well, here, here's the thing. This is a difference between terminology, I would feel. I don't think this movie is ever boring, but it does encourage disengagement. Mm, that is a good good way to put it. Yes. That is the thing. This movie, in technical terms, and the appraisal of it, is never boring. But because of the choices that it's making, it is aggressively goading the audience into disengaging with what it's doing, which will then be felt as boredom. Yeah, it can distance the audience, I think, in, in certain times. Like, uh, there's a fun scene that I really liked where Emma Peel is caught in an M.C. Escher staircase and is trying to find a way out, and the scene keeps sort of repeating. I loved it. I, th- I thought that scene was um, really beautifully constructed from an art design standpoint and uh, fun, you know, from a style standpoint. I, I really like that. But it's another instance where, like, okay, a character dives out a window to escape their current situation, and what happens? Oh, they pass out and then they wake up after a, after a cross dissolve. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, I it's like, God damn it. <laughs> yes, it, it's because the movie as a whole was already filled with bizarre big mission statement choices. When it gets hacked down to those kind of things and they stack on top of that, then it becomes like overload. But I had a lot of fun watching the Avengers and a lot of fun with its particular decision to really lean into a specific style, the crowds be damned in a way. I mean, like, okay, at the end of this, when we finally have our big showdown between John Steed and August DeWinter, they're fighting in the, in the you know, like you said, there's this great succession of sets and miniatures and all this stuff, and they're fighting in, in on this catwalk, essentially above a big tank. August DeWinter gets stabbed, and above is some mechanism for his his weather machine, and a bolt of lightning just happens to come down strike him and lift him up into the sky as he is being fried into pieces. Yeah. He's being basically fried by a lightning tornado and pulled up out of this giant like silo or tower that this uh, third act giant explosion is taking place. Like it's, it's pretty fucking dope dude. And then Uma Thurman has a pretty fun fight on like wires with Eddie Izzard. It's like, yeah, I, I like all this. These sets rock. There's wind, there's rain, there's waves. The fight choreography sucks and the shooting of the fight choreography sucks, but that specifically it is it is not shot well. I can't speak to the choreography itself because either uh but what's the director's name? Chechik? Jeremiah Chechik, yeah. Chechik, yeah. Like either he or his second unit or whoever shot that and they cut it together. The fighting in the movie does not seem to be at all what the movie is interested in, which which is a detriment to it. Yeah, often the fight choreography is seen in wide shots that don't really emphasize the dynamics of the fight. Well, it's 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 wide shots and and a lot of intercutting. Yeah, and it's obscured by wind and rain and waves. Um, so it's it's really unexciting sword fighting. Even in an earlier street fight with, between John Steed and Eddie Izzard and a bunch of goons, it's the same thing. Without any of those kind of you know wind rain obstructions, it's like yeah, they're just really wide shots that are kind of letting the choreography play out. It's shaky and they're just cutting a little bit too much that there doesn't seem to be a very sensible flow to the fight scenes. It's not that you can't understand them. Like it's clear what's happening, but they're just never interesting or engaging in the way that we want that kind of physicality to come across. Yeah. And you know, the the movie is still filled with wonders, like things that work really, really well. There's an invisible man in this movie Uh, and the only thing, you know, that like the invisible man is there is like, there's this pipe and it's not a CG pipe that it was just like real pipe that they put there that, you know, they, they made it look like it was being smoked. There's real smoke. It was obviously, uh, either hung on wires or put on some sort of, um, uh, apparatus to, to puppeteer. And then it was, that apparatus was painted out. Like it's really beautifully done work. Uh, and like I said, the sets in this last act are absolutely incredible, but after they dispatch our mad scientist, Emma Peel and John Steed get into like the control bubble of this big weather machine. And they're like, we can't turn it off. Oh, no. And then we cut back to fucking Jim Broadbent and uh, Carmen Ajogo, actually. It's nice to see that she's in this movie. Um, and they're like, oh, no, we've lost uh, John Steed and Emma Peel in a great explosion. And there is a pretty fucking good explosion. Of course, in the next scene, John Steed and Emma Peel are in the bubble and they float up and they're okay. 
And it's like, well, that's a really uninteresting way to show that these characters survived the giant explosion just to cut away to, again, cinematic treasure Jim Broadbent and Carmen and Jogo. And just say, oh, yes, uh, uh, must have survived. Maybe it was, that was an explosion. Uh, okay, well, I just wish this was more engaged as an action film. Yes, I agree with that. As an action movie, I think The Avengers mostly falls flat. But the tone, the style, the the incredible commitment to making... What, what, what I'm kind of surprised at the movie is that it didn't feel like it needed to update itself to feel like it took place in 1998. Correct. Like it really does. It does. It really does feel like they gave the, the people who made a sixties television show a hundred million dollars to make a movie in 1966 or whatever. Right. There's a timelessness to it, like an anachronistic sense to it because it still feels like the sixties, but also it's this like alternate sci-fi sixties where a mad scientist has control over the weather and you can buy it from him. We also never even mentioned that this movie has a clone of Uma Thurman in it. So there are sometimes two Uma Thurmans on screen. That should be way cooler than it is. Well, the movie just that that is clearly a victim of the cuts because it it very quickly explains that away. There's an entire thing about, I I guess, Emma Peel looks like August DeWinter's long lost love. That's how he's introduced. We, you know, pedestal upwards to a portrait that looks like. Emma Peel, and he's very, very lusty uh, after her in, in, in the scenes that he has. That's a nice way of putting it. He's pretty peppy Le Pew. Sure. But that's never, that's completely dropped in the movie. Yeah. Uh, my final summation is I actually enjoyed my time with the Avengers quite a bit. It is an extremely flawed movie. I would love nothing more than to see the director's cut of this movie because it may still not be a great movie. But I have to believe it would be a more coherent and cohesive movie. One can only hope. Now, I'm not going to go to bat for the for this movie as much as you did. However, I didn't hate my time with it. Uh, I think there's plenty to like in it. And I like it enough to give it a second shot, assuming like – you know, if there was a director's cut, I would watch it. You know, I would totally watch a director's cut just for comparison. You know, I'm a sucker for alternate cuts. Um, but I, you know, I found enough to like here that I'd be like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's put that sucker on. Let's, let's see the two hour version that, you know, um, has all this stuff that's been missing and let's see, let's see what's going on in this movie. My, my feeling is labeling. This is the, one of the worst movies ever. Obviously that's a bad take and a boring take, but more so I, I can't go so far as to say that this movie needs reappraisal, but I do think that its reputation needs to be dusted off a little bit. It's not like we've watched way worse movies on here and worse movies that were big studio productions. Catwoman is a worse movie than this. Sure. And yet we had fun with Catwoman. We still had fun with Catwoman, you know, genuinely non iron, you know, unironically. And I didn't find hardly any irony in the Avengers for me. No, I mean, hey, look, the movie ends. And when the credits roll, Grace Jones sings a Bond song, basically. Um, it's called Storm. Uh, and it's fucking good. It's Grace Jones. That's <laughs> so fantastic. It's like, all right. Yeah, OK. So as a mad scientist movie, though, it's pretty weak because we we don't really get any traditional mad scientist stuff from him. He's just as much a mad capitalist as he is a mad scientist. Sure. I mean, that that's, you know, the two are not mutually exclusive. But I will say the problem with the mad scientist angle on this, because I think he's actually a good mad scientist like his, you know, it's like I'm controlling weather and stuff like that. Like you said, that whole sequence with where they go to his weather shop is like, this is fascinating and cool. Yeah, it's great. But I think the problem is that they clearly just hacked off so much of his deeper character stuff that we never get a real sense of him beyond. And and that's okay because like I said, I, I enjoy the one note pure supervillain. You know, he, he has the typical mad scientist. He, he basically says, you know, they all called me mad. Well, I'll show them moment when we're introduced <laughs> yeah. to him. So like he's, he's hitting, he's probably going to be the most stereotypical mad scientist. We do this month. He's not a lab coat, mad scientist. And in some ways I like that. It's kind of bucking that tradition. Uh, instead, he's a mad scientist that wears a giant teddy bear outfit and also uh, a rather uh, striking traditional Scottish garb. 
I like his I like his last uh his final suit. It's like this black and red tuxedo looking thing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hey, I can't knock the costumes in this flick. They're they're good. It's very good. Um so yeah, the the Avengers, it's on HBO Max. I I come around to recommending it, but as something that's like just enjoy the very simple Saturday morning cartoon nature of it. If you attempt any deeper read of this movie, that's when it starts to wrinkle your brain. Yeah, for me, this one goes onto the shelf under the curiosities section where it's like, I don't know if I can call this experience really, really enjoyable or like really terrible. But, you know, this is definitely a curiosity. It's definitely something to be talked about and not forgotten. Um, now, if you wanted to pull another movie off the shelf to pair with the Avengers, uh, that's something we love to do here at Genre Vision. It's also something that we want you to do. Uh, the shelf is a uh, is, is a collaborative thing. Uh, if you go to genrevision.com, you can find the post for this episode on the main page and leave a comment. Tell us what movie you would like to pair or recommend in addition to the Avengers. Uh, and if you do so, we will read it on the next episode of genre vision uh drew what are you pulling off the shelf for the avengers well i want to pick another big expensive studio movie that is extremely one note and committed to a very strange and frankly uh off-putting style decision but one that not only is better than the avengers but i'm going to come around to and saying that i think it's a truly great film this is the wachowski's speed racer uh this is thankfully gotten reappraisal over the last few years and is beginning to truly become a cult film and it so deserves it i think speed racer was a, a, an astonishingly surreal art film that happened to sneak into the studio system it is bracingly weird um it's, it's definitely time for me to rewatch this um because i wasn't ready for it when i first saw it um but you know hopefully i can come to it now with fresh eyes um, because I, I have no appreciation or love for the original anime. Me neither. None, none at all. And I, I, I remember seeing this in theaters and it was a similar, like, I, I didn't like it the first time I saw it because I think it just, it, I hate to sound, this is so glib, but it's like, yeah, it just, it blew my mind. Like, <laughs> but in a bad way, I wasn't ready, but over the years I keep like, it's like, wow. Yeah. The way that movie messes with time and editing to where there will be huge sequences where I'm like, we haven't had a cut. It's doing things with characters in frame and the formalist decisions that it's making are so antithetical to what people have come to expect from mainstream movies. It was never like, that's why I have no reservation calling speed racer a straight up art film. Yeah, uh, I, I would probably agree with that assessment as well. It's one that I don't think a lot of people can. It's it's just making so many decisions that people will be subconsciously rejecting because of the programming they've experienced from all of the countless, much more, you know, realist and, and classicist approaches to filmmaking that they've imbibed. This is something that throws everything like there are, there are moments that you won't even register that will feel weird to you. But if you really analyze, it's like, oh, right. This movie has no depth of field in shots. Yeah, everything is infinite DOF. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. But I'm really glad that it's 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 finally being realized. And I think that's why, like, looking at the I think this if the Avengers had gone this far as Speed Racer did, I think it would be on that level. But unfortunately, it you know just a circumstance of the times, it had to conform to certain conventions. The Wachowskis you know, being fresh off the matrix movies and absolute golden children for, for, for Warner brothers were given the opportunity to make something that groundbreakingly odd. Yeah, it was, it's, it's kind of a back to the future thing. You know, your kids are going to love it. Right. right. And we'll say, I mean, I hope so. I hope speed racer continues to find an audience. Cause I, I really think I really advocate for that movie. And it's, uh, it's one that, is not going to be for everybody, but for the people it's for, I think it's one of the best times you can have. But Travis, what are you going to pull off the shelf for The Avengers 1998? Uh, this isn't a great movie. Uh, in fact, there are aspects of it that have aged really, really poorly, but there are certain structural elements and elements of attitude and style about this film that I think uh, were done way, way better here and um, kind of one up The Avengers in, in a lot of um, regards. And that's Kingsman, The Secret Service. So 
you know, it's about a secret British organization. Uh, we have to establish what the organization is, why it exists, who they answer to, uh, who is in the organization and why. Um, and then of course it talks a lot about, uh, you know, British fashion, uh, British nationalism and pride. Uh, again, these are all things that aren't necessarily inherently good, but the movie makes an argument for them as being substantial for the film and being cool because let's face it, blockbuster movies traffic and cool. It is their main currency. Um, the Kingsman movies, I think have a certain kind of cool about them. That is really unique. Um, again, they're not fantastic films and we're still waiting on the third one to come out. It's been delayed like fucking indefinitely due to the pandemic, which also has Ray Fiennes in it. Yeah. Enough. Ray Fiennes is in the lead. Also Risa Fiennes, interestingly enough, playing Rasputin. But, um, yeah, I'll see that when it, when it, when it comes out, whenever that is, um, we'll see. The second one was not great. No, it was definitely not great, but it had interesting elements in it. You know, it was, it was definitely something that was bold. Um, and I like the, the boldness that the Kingsman movies have. I think, Colin Firth kind of plays that similar stiff upper lip kind of character that Ray finds might, um, or he's kind of the equivalent of the Tommy Lee Jones of this sort of men in black thing. Mm -hmm. And there are certain just structural elements about that Kingsman screenplay that I think the Avengers was lacking. So these two movies complement each other. And that's one of the reasons we have the shelf is to kind of fit two movies together like puzzle pieces. And that's why we're going to head over to the listener shelf picks for last week's episode on honey. I shrunk the kids. Cthulhu Ferrigno had, Ant-Man, of course. Wall Drump has had Little Shop of Horrors, another great Rick Moranis movie. JT had an anti-shelf pick of Food of the Gods. <laughs> Steven Nesbella went with Clash the Titans for another great Scorpion stop-motion fight. Eric Fuchs went with the sequel, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. Mr. Milksteak had Inner Space from Joe Dante and the Anatomy Park episode of Rick and Morty. Good episode. Great episode. And finally, Eric Johnson went with The Incredible Shrinking Man, both the Richard Matheson original story and the original film, which I am going to watch this year. I've never seen that and watched the trailer for it when we did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and I, I'm very interested in that movie. Mm, maybe maybe a shrinky theme month. We'll see. Yeah, maybe. So thank you so much. Love, love, love having these listener shelf picks every week. Make sure to go to genrevision.com and comment on the post for this episode with your shelf picks. Now we're going to do some calls to action real quick, but stick around because we still have Currently Consuming coming up, where Travis and I are going to talk about a kaiju showdown movie, King Kong versus Godzilla. For calls to action, we do want to start off with some awesome news, as always, is Travis, you've got some guest spots coming up on some other podcasts. Yes, uh, if you check out the podcast Chat Cemetery, you will see an episode of me and uh, host Deanna Chapman talking about Stephen King's book, Full Dark New Stars. If you check out Deanna's other podcast, Welcome to Geekdom, you will see an episode, a recent episode there of me talking about one of my favorite bands, Motion City Soundtrack. There will also be an upcoming episode of that show uh, with me and Deanna talking about The Amazing Spider-Man, the movie uh, starring Andrew Garfield, the kind of weird intergenerational take uh, from Sony that uh, was basically an Ashcan movie. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so there's there's my take in a, in a nutshell there. But um, yeah, that's always something we recommend is checking out Deanna's podcast because we're on them pretty frequently and uh, they are fun shows to be on. She's one of our favorite collaborators. Absolutely. Lo love Deanna and love her shows. Go check them out. Chat Cemetery and welcome to Geekdom. Uh, we also want to say if you love what we're doing here on Genrevision, we are just straight up begging you to go to the Apple Podcast Store and leave a rating and review for the show. And if you do leave a written review, we will feature it here on the show. We need those reviews, y'all. And, and we've gotten some recently and they really do help out. But the more we can get, honestly, the more we can grow the show. So please go to the Apple podcast store. Just take a minute to write that review and post it. And if you do, we'll feature it here on the show. Last but not least, if you would like to get more genre vision content, you can go to patreon.com slash genre vision and sign up to become a premium subscriber for just five bucks a month. You will get weekly pre-shows this week. We had, uh, a very in-depth discussion about the accessibility of movies on streaming platforms and how they are being improperly presented. It was actually a very, very fun conversation. You'll also get monthly extended currently consumings that we do. Uh, we'll do some special episodes from time to time, some supplemental material for all of the other genre vision network of shows, just five bucks a month for all of that premium stuff at patreon.com slash genre vision. 
So let's do some currently consuming. Nom, 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 nom. Travis and I are teaming up this week because we both watched King Kong versus Godzilla. Uh, this was kind of preparation and research for our ups, uh, upcoming episode on Godzilla versus Kong. Uh, I had seen this movie when I was a kid, but had not had not revisited since and had not seen the Japanese version. Travis and I watched the dub version, and then we also found uh, a copy of the Japanese version. I watched the Japanese version as well. Uh, I recommend watching the Japanese version if you can. Uh, But King Kong versus Godzilla is a really intriguing film when taken into the context of the larger kind of Toho era and the Godzilla era. Uh, This was their first color Godzilla movie. The third Godzilla film overall, mm-hmm. and a return of the uh, original director, Ishiro Honda, um, but in a very, very different take from the original Gojira. This is such a different tone and such a different look. Yeah, I mean, character-wise, at this point, Godzilla is still a destructive force and a, a an antagonist. Uh, but at this point, uh, Ishiro Honda decided to make a satire, which I don't think comes across extremely well in the American version, because not only is the American version dubbed much like they did with the other Godzilla movies uh, before this, they filmed specific scenes that interjected uh, English speaking actors into the movie. Uh, In this, it is a woefully boring news scene that they continue to cut to of this guy talking directly to the camera like, well, Godzilla is now here, and we're going to explain some more stuff to you. It is it is the most yeah. droning exposition. They put a boring white guy in a closet with a lamp and a, a UN flag that they just, like, tacked to the wall behind him. It looks like a set from the Eric Andre show. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah, it sucks. So basically what they've done is they've cut all of the uh, introduction of the Japanese protagonists out of the film and replaced it with just an exposition machine who is like, you know, representing the UN as like a source of broadcast news. Very strange. And they, they cast a couple of uh, other talking heads to supplement the original Japanese footage, but basically they replace all of the original Japanese exposition with news talking heads. It is a, uh, it's a decision. It's a choice. Um, it's a shit choice. It's not one that affects the movie, uh, well overall, However, like you and I watched the American version and we watched it from start to finish and you and I laughed a lot. You know, it is it is not an unfunny film, but I feel like the American version with the dub and the intercutting of new material was basically clowning on Honda's movie, which was already a really funny movie. I mean, yeah, it's it it was a satire and there is deliberate comedy in the original version. But this is a bigger thing and and another reason why I don't like a lot of the Americanized versions of these movies, especially back in this time period, is that there is a real sense that they were taking the piss with these movies because that's what they assumed American audiences felt. It's like American audiences knew it's like these are guys in suits. This is junk. This is clown shoes for kids and stuff. And the people Americanizing it were like, all right, let's lean into that and embrace it. And granted, it probably helped cultivate a cult following for the series in America, but now archivally and retroactively it's made worse movies. Um, the, the Japanese version is a legitimately funny movie with good satire in it and also still being a fun, like, I think this is a really important movie for the Godzilla franchise because this is the movie that establishes these Godzilla movies are going to be fun now. Godzilla Raids Again, which is the second movie. Which I just saw, and it's not very good. Yeah, it's it still got a very... Well, I'm sure you also watched the Americanized version. No, I watched the original. You did watch the Japanese? Okay. Yeah, that's the one that's on HBO Max, so eat it. It's still got some era of tonal seriousness about it, even though it's the first time, like, okay, Godzilla's going to fight another monster. It's still very much grappling with World War II. Like, right. that's its main fallout thing, because, like, the characters are all ex-pilots from World War II. Um, But in this, you know, in this one, in in King Kong versus Godzilla, they have completely changed the function of these characters as like comedic 
stars. You know, King Kong, there is a moment in that, well, there's a bunch of funny moments with King Kong in, in this movie, um, no matter which version you watch, where it's like King Kong is like the ultimate slapstick character. He He's in a big, the big climactic fight with Godzilla and he falls down on his face and bashes his giant noggin into a rock and passes. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the thing that King Kong versus Godzilla has to frame them as like, well, there's a straight man and a funny man. King Kong is the funny man. Oh, yeah. King Kong gets funny reaction shots in the movie. He gets funny reaction shots. He gets drunk and passes out off of magic berries. Oh, yeah. He likes the sauce, bro. He get he gets strung up by a bunch of helicopters and puppeted out like a twisted up marionette for the final fight scene. They basically fly him out with giant balloons. It is fucking incredible. It's goofball as hell, um, whereas Godzilla is still presented as... A, a real threat. Yeah, but he looks like shit in this movie. He actually looks worse in this movie than he did in the original film. Well, in the original film, they were trying to make him super scary. Like in this one, he is like, he has completely embraced his cartoon mascot self. Yeah. It's, it's not a great looking costume. It's one of my least favorite of the, uh, vintage Godzilla costumes. Yeah. But you the, know what? I, I had fun watching the American cut of this movie, even though I, re, I, you know, granted it's not, you know, very good. I also watched a substantial chunk of the Japanese cut, which is, I believe in the creative, uh, well, it's no, it's, it's public domain. I was able to find it at archive.org. So, um, it's, it's available if you want to see the Japanese version. Um, it's not restored like the criterion, uh, American version, uh, which looks great, but no, the, uh, yeah, the Criterion version will have both the American and Japanese versions of it. And I certainly recommend that you watch the Japanese version, but I will be interested to see, uh, cause I believe that Godzilla versus Kong will, I'm going to be interested to see how that movie grapples with its inherent silliness because the concept of King Kong versus Godzilla is silly. Like, and that's okay, but people don't really like silly stuff as we learned. And while watching the Avengers, uh, 1998. Well, when Monkey fights the dinosaur coming up here, you know, next month, we will find out exactly how silly they're willing to go with it. But hopefully it is something resembling the silliness in the original King Kong versus Godzilla. Hopefully, hopefully. Well, we're going to close things out while well, we would close things out with our comment, comment of, of the week. week. But I want to award basically the genre vision comment section award to all of our commenters because the comments on our Honey, I Shrunk the Kids episode has now become our most commented upon episode. Uh, I think it's still getting comments. Yeah, uh, the number is still going up. I think as I look at it right now, it stands at 79 comments. And, you know, for being a little independent website like we are and for striking out on our own like we did, that is a really impressive number of comments. And here's the great thing about our comment section. You all are so fucking good that... I don't have to moderate like I did on other websites. You all know what is appropriate, what isn't, how to have decent conversations, how to treat people like human beings. This is why we have our own website. You know, we got YouTube and sometimes some people leave nice comments on there. Sometimes they call <laughs> us soy boys for having us for having takes on Dorian Gray and in, uh, in, in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. But you know what? We don't get that kind of crap at genrevision.com because you all are the fucking best. Well, you've now invited it by putting it out there in the world, but okay. Eat me. Uh, no, seriously, we can't pick a comment of the week this week. And it's like an amazing problem to have because you all have made the genre vision comment section what it is and it, that has not been at our behest you've just done that naturally you know we've i hope that we've fostered that with the level of conversation that we provide in the show but y'all have just done that and you've made going to the comment section of genre vision.com every week the the high like one of the highlights of doing this uh it's amazing it is i i'm not being hyperbolic when i say it is legit magic to me that y'all have maintained such an incredible comment section uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of all of you. So thank you so much for making Genre Vision the movie club that it is. We, we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you so much. Uh, we will be back next week, continuing March Madness, Mad Scientist Month, with Sam Raimi's Dark Man. Yeah, if you've never seen Dark Man before, you uh, absolutely have to now because we're talking about it next week. Yes, please. I don't care if you've seen Dark Man 10 times. Watch Dark Man again next week and come back and listen to our episode on it. So please, please, please come back next week for Dark Man. We'll be thrilled to have you. As always, I'm Drew Deitch. I'm Travis Newton. And we will see you next week right here on Genre Vision. <laughs>